Sometimes the media's lack of self-awareness severely damages our political scene. The media has a massive instrumental effect on what Americans hear and how they perceive things. But when the media covers politics, it so often washes its own hands of any responsibility. Today, I'll be telling you about a perfect example of how that happens and why it has to stop. This comes from a listener who asked me to fact-check Republicans' attacks on Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan district attorney who led the recent prosecution of former President Trump, which led to convictions on all 34 counts. At first, I figured it would be a relatively quick thing to fact-check. But then I looked into this and discovered that it highlights a big issue that I haven't even touched on yet on this show. It's an issue that affects you as a news consumer, but it could also affect you if you ever find yourself in the news. You know, you can't always control if you're going to be in the news. Sometimes you're just at the wrong place, wrong time. Or I guess if you want to be in the news, then right place, right time. But you can suddenly find yourself part of a story. And what happened here could also happen to you. But if you think that this is going to be just some, I don't know, Democratic Party talking point thing about unfair attacks on Alvin Bragg, then I'll let you know right now, coming up in this same episode, I will be telling you about something that the National Review got right. That is a conservative publication. Uh, they pointed out something very important about the Washington Post and Al Jazeera and reporting about Israel and Gaza. Anyone can get something right. Anyone can get something wrong. And what we need to do is separate who's saying it from what it is so that we can take an objective look at information. Also, for the record, by far the largest political group in America is composed of people who do not identify as Democrats or Republicans. They identify as independents. It's not even close. Also today, an update on a viral story about a viral story. All that coming up on They Stand Corrected. Hello and welcome. I'm Josh Lebs. This is my podcast that focuses on fact-checking the news. In each episode, we look not just at something that the media is getting wrong, but about what it says about the media ecosystem that we are living in. I spent 20 years inside mainstream media on NPR and CNN, on air and online, including a lot of on-air fact-checking. And I have seen how we have structural problems in the media that need to be tackled, but we can fix this together. I don't expect you all to take my word for anything, which is why, with each episode, I send out lots of links so you can see things for yourself. To get all that, be sure to sign up for the free newsletter. You can find it at the link in my show notes or at my website, joshlevs.com, J-O-S-H-L-E-V-S.com. You can also send in questions, and I might answer them here on the show. In fact, that is what inspired the first thing that I'm looking at here today. This is a message that I got from a listener. What's up, Josh? This is Tony Scruggs from Culver City, and I love what you're doing to prevent the democracy demolition of 24-7 toxic disinformation. My They Stand Corrected investigation centers around the recent questioning of FBI Director Ray by Senator Haggerty of Tennessee. Not only does Senator Haggerty violate decorum by using GOP code for FU, you know, using the noun Democrat as an adjective, he also spreads the false BS claim that District Attorney Bragg publicly ran on getting the ex-president. Will you please help shine a light and remind mainstream media that they are not just observers of a sinking ship called democracy? They're actually passenger slash crew members with keys to the extraction pump. And whether it's water or BS, if we don't turn on the pump, we sink. Thanks, Josh. I love when you all share your thoughts with me. Okay. I will go over with you what he's talking about and why it's so important right now. It involves important facts that the media have been ignoring, but I'll also show you why this example that Tony brought up turns out to be an even bigger story about media failure. First, here are the basics. Alvin Bragg is the Manhattan DA who led the recent successful prosecution of Trump. Republicans have been on the attack against him. No surprise there. This is what Tony was referring to in a hearing that was supposed to be about the FBI and its budget. Senator Bill Hagerty, of course, brought this up. Lawmakers often take any opportunity to cite their latest talking points, even when those talking points have nothing to do with the topic you're supposed to be talking about. And in this era for the GOP, Trump generally determines whatever those talking points are. So even though the New York case was a state case, 
not a federal case. Hagerty still said this. What we saw happen last week was Alvin Bragg, who ran on a platform of getting Trump to just that with a flimsy made up theory and a criminal conviction. OK, so Tony is saying that the media should point out what Bragg actually said during his campaign instead of just letting stuff like this fly. So first, I went and looked at how the media has been handling these kinds of complaints. And I found reports that have included accusations like that. Accusations that Bragg ran on a platform saying he was going to get Trump. Reports have been including these kinds of accusations for months, since well before the convictions. ABC News included a clip of Trump saying it. Um, and then rather than telling people what Bragg actually said during his campaign, ABC moved right on. Prosecutor Alvin Bragg of New York, who campaigned on the fact that he would get President Trump. I'm going to get him. Bragg today describing an extraordinary surge in threats he and his office received the month Trump was indicted, including messages that said, leave Trump alone or Bragg will get assassinated. Those points that ABC moved on with are important. And that's why I kept it here. Um, also, know those are a strong reminder of how these kinds of claims can lead to real dangers. But as you heard there, they did not stop to tell you whether it's true that Bragg actually said that during his campaign. And there are a bunch of other instances like this. MSNBC had on Robert Ray, a member of Trump's legal team. Here's something he said. And then Alvin Bragg got it on a campaign promise that he would tackle Donald Trump. And again, no one jumped in to explain whether that's true or what Bragg actually said. So what did Bragg actually say during his campaign for Manhattan DA? When he was on the campaign trail, a lot of voters wanted to know that he would not be one of the many people in public life who seemed to be just too terrified to take on a former president. We have seen a lot of people who seem to be scared. So they've moved incredibly slowly or just dropped cases involving Trump behaviors and allegations against him. If you look at what Alvin Bragg said, you'll see that he kept emphasizing that he goes where the facts lead and that his record shows that he's not afraid. Here's a clip from one interview he did uh, with something called Manhattan Neighborhood Network and the Gotham Gazette. From what you've seen so far, just generally speaking, do you think that Donald Trump as a private citizen should see action from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to pursue criminal charges? Give me 30 seconds on this one. Yes. So at, at the AG's office, I held Trump accountable for his misconduct with the Trump Foundation. We did the Trump University case. We sued his administration more than 100 times since this DACA Muslim travel ban. I will hold him accountable by following the facts where they go. What I've seen in the public domain is deeply troubling. This misvaluation of assets to me sounds like the basis of a, of a, of a case that could be criminal. Uh, and as you said, I need to be judicious as someone who may inherit this case. Uh, but what I can say is you look at my record of not just white collar crime generally, but specifically with Donald Trump. Uh, and people can have confidence that I'm going to go where the facts take me. That is the kind of thing he said. Not, oh, I'm going to get Trump. Not, I'm going to tackle Trump. Now, you can say, well, Republicans didn't mean those words literally. Either way, reporters should point out the kind of thing he said. This language that he used is very lawyerly, very judicious. It's just something you get used to when you interview lawyers and quote lawyers. You hear a lot of language like this. But here's where this story gets way bigger for what we talk about here on this show. Why did Alvin Bragg talk about Trump? So much of the time, it's because the media asked him. Journalists kept asking him about Trump. For example, that clip I just played you, that was at the tail end of a 30-minute interview in which he had talked about so many other things. Why did he even talk about Trump? Because this journalist asked him to, so he answered. To its credit, PolitiFact pointed this out. PolitiFact is a website that does a bunch of fact-checking uh, when I was on the air on CNN, I used to interview someone from PolitiFact pretty often. Now, PolitiFact gets a bunch of things right, not everything. I'll include a link to their write-up about this issue in the newsletter. And here's another example that shows what I'm saying. This is a clip from a uh, local station in New York, WABC. Today, Bragg did not want to talk much about Trump, but he wanted to assure voters that he knows what he's doing. How did they know that he didn't want to talk much about Trump? Well, it's got to be because they asked. OK, so here's what we actually have in this campaign. Bragg was asked over and over about whether he would be willing to pursue charges against Trump. 
And he kept answering the way you just heard. Now, you might say, well, he didn't have to answer. He could have refused comment. Uh, yeah, sure, he could have. Would he have won? And also, is that even the right or ethical thing to do? You're facing a vote by the people. People want to know that you're unafraid to pursue charges against someone, even if that person is powerful. So you point to your real life experience. In this context, let's talk about what the media is doing. In his campaign, the media kept asking him about Trump and he answered. And often those are the sound bites or quotes that made the reports. And now the media is letting Republicans say, oh, that guy during his campaign, he said he would go after Trump. While in reality, he campaigned on a lot of things, but the media kept pushing the Trump stuff. And there's no reference to their role in doing that. So given all this, you can hear how incredibly unself-aware it is for the media to keep letting those complaints go without any kind of fact-checking. And sometimes it's members of the media themselves who say it. Here's Michael Smirkanish on CNN. And now facing trial at the hands of Alvin Bragg, who campaigned much like Letitia James did, saying that he'd go after Trump. This would be a good moment to mention that um, I was interviewed by Michael. I think it was on his radio show when my book came out, and it was a good interview. I liked it. And this is about the system. It's about leadership not having the self-awareness about the media's role in pushing an angle during a campaign and then staying silent when the other side complains, oh, that person kept talking about something during the campaign. I've talked a lot on this show about how truth equals facts plus content. So the facts here are what Alvin Bragg actually said, and you can characterize them in different ways, but the media should emphasize what he said. And the context is that he was asked about it over and over. So just saying Alvin Bragg ran on a platform of going after Trump, that is an unfair and dishonest summary. So what should the media do? Here's part of what they should say. Anytime someone makes that complaint, tell your readers, your listeners, your viewers, something like this. During his campaign for a Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg was asked many times, including by the media, whether he would be willing to pursue charges against Trump. He repeatedly emphasized that he would let the facts lead him, and he pointed to his own record having taken on Trump in other contexts. All right, something like that would be a start. But the media would need one more crucial point to cover the context. I'll tell you what that is, plus what the National Review got right involving the Washington Post and Al Jazeera and disastrous coverage of the war in Gaza after this. I'm going on the road. I've been hearing from groups wanting to bring me in for talks and events on these topics. As you may know, I speak at all sorts of companies, organizations, schools. I've also spoken at the UN, Congress, the Oxford Student Union. You can see a bunch of videos and uh, get in touch through the newsletter linked in the show notes or at my website, joshlevs.com. How great would it be to come out and meet as many of you as possible in person? When Trump and Republicans who support him complain that Manhattan TA Alvin Bragg is driven by a political agenda, they are engaging in a level of hypocrisy that is so obvious it can basically be seen from space. While he was president, Trump used the Justice Department and every part of the legal system that he could get his hands on for political purposes to reward people who sucked up to him until he was done with them. And then he kicked them out and said how awful they are and how they should be banished from his world. Journalists should point out this hypocrisy. To his credit, Asa Hutchinson talked about this in an interview. He's a former governor of Arkansas, and he tried to get the GOP presidential nomination for this election year. He did an interview with CNN. So I think it is wrong, uh, and I think it was wrong for uh, Alvin Bragg, and likewise to a campaign on prosecuting Donald Trump. It doesn't serve the cause of justice well. Uh, you're there to do justice, and so, uh, and you, but you have to take the the words of Donald Trump very seriously because you reflect back. Uh, whenever Bill Barr was attorney general or Jeff Sessions was attorney general, Donald Trump did not hesitate to privately and publicly pressure them to do what he wanted. And that's not good for our justice system. That's putting it mildly. Anytime a report includes Trump or his supporters saying that Bragg is so political, the media should not only report what I mentioned earlier, they should also point out the hypocrisy. 
news organizations should have this instant hypocrisy meter that just goes off when something that obvious happens. This is a kind of hypocrisy we've seen in other stories I've discussed here. Like on MSNBC, Joy Reid's disastrous interview with the Queen of Jordan, in which they were both unbelievably hypocritical. And the same hypocrisy applies to a topic I discussed last week, Al Jazeera. I explained that Al Jazeera is a state-owned propaganda outlet of the Qatari government. But the mainstream media here in this country so often refuse to acknowledge or mention that it is state-owned media. Hypocrisy around this has been on full display in recent days. And again, so many news organizations don't even seem to notice it. Here's the deal. Israel launched a daring and successful rescue mission. They successfully rescued four hostages who were among the many kidnapped in the horrific, nightmarish October 7th massacres by Hamas. Israel reported that three of these hostages were being held by a quote-unquote journalist and his family in Gaza. This would not be surprising. There are people identified as Palestinian journalists who are part of Hamas and involved with it. Anyway, this person has been a journalist for something called the Palestine Chronicle, but also named on Al Jazeera's website and contributed something there. When Israel pointed out his Al Jazeera connection, Al Jazeera itself called that, quote, a continuation of the process of slander and misinformation aimed at harming Al Jazeera's reputation, professionalism, and independence. I saw that quote in a CNN story. The CNN story did not point out the incredible hypocrisy of Al Jazeera talking about any other entity's independence. Independent from what? It is a propaganda outlet of the Qatari government. That is a fact. News organizations should always point out this kind of hypocrisy. But that's not the only glaring problem with this coverage. Here's something else. The CNN story I just mentioned had a headline that serves as a powerful reminder of how the news follows a completely different set of standards for Israel. The headline said this, Israel alleges journalists held hostages in Gaza without providing evidence. I worked at CNN for years. CNN, just like so many other news agencies, knows that most people only see headlines. What do headlines usually look like? Well, usually we would say, Israel says, or Israel, colon, journalists held hostages in Gaza. So you're still demonstrating that that information comes from somewhere. That's what headlines look like all the time. You see it all the time, I'm sure. Adding words to a headline that says someone has not provided evidence, that almost never happens. Headlines regularly carry what governments and organizations and people claim. I opened up the CNN website and just scrolled through headlines and went looking for anything remotely like this. They never do that. Here's just one of many examples. Last week, I discussed how hundreds of journalists get killed in dangerous situations and the media doesn't report on those at all. And then the media rushed to obsessively cover the death of one Al Jazeera journalist amid fighting in the West Bank a couple years ago because they saw an opportunity to blame Israel. So suddenly it was a huge story. In their coverage of that, a CNN headline said that this journalist was, quote, killed by Israeli forces using armor-piercing bullet, Palestinian Authority investigation says. Well, guess what? The Palestinian Authority did not provide CNN with evidence for that. But the headline didn't say, but doesn't provide evidence. So when it's a headline saying Israel did some horrible thing and a journalist is a victim, then there's no need to point out that no one's providing evidence. But when it's Israel rescuing hostages from a journalist doing a horrible thing, well, then suddenly you have to put without providing evidence into the headline. It's a separate set of standards. It's so hypocritical. But it gets even worse. CNN and other news agencies know that during wars and rescue operations, it's normal not to give away sources of information. Here's a conversation about this uh, between CNN's Jake Tapper and Naftali Bennett, former Israeli prime minister. I don't think there's any question that he was a journalist, but have you seen evidence that he was holding them captive? And, and can you press the Israeli government to share that evidence? I assume at a certain point the government will share. We don't want to burn our sources, but uh, it's funny because to hear Al Jazeera deny that he's a reporter when his name is on their website as a reporter is ridiculous. Al Jazeera and Qatar are terror organizations, a terror state and a terror organization. The fact that Al Jazeera still calls itself uh, a news outlet is ridiculous. 
Uh, their hands are, are in blood. And this is not the first time that Al Jazeera reporters are part of uh, Hamas. We've discovered many uh, additional cases. You have to understand, we are fighting uh, a population that unfortunately massively supports Hamas. I decided to share that whole clip with you because it's such a sign of how inverted the media's role has become. So much of the time, the media carries Hamas propaganda as though it's fact and doesn't even tell you that it's from Hamas. It's in moments like this that crucial facts even get mentioned. In this case, Bennett managed to mention facts about Al Jazeera that viewers would not have heard otherwise. Now, to be clear, the fact that evidence showing that a journalist held three hostages, that, that the evidence has not been shared yet, that should absolutely be in the story, along with an explanation that it can involve sensitive intelligence. Headlining the lack of evidence, that is a political biased move designed to make people cast doubt. If you don't always say without giving evidence, you just say so-and-so says, well, why not continue that? Well, because it's Israel. And meanwhile, you know what the media never cites any lack of evidence for? The alleged death tolls from Gaza. I've talked about this in previous episodes as well, how Hamas dramatically dropped the number of women and children allegedly killed in Gaza. And they're still, even now, citing Hamas figures. Here's a clip from a report that was also on CNN recently. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza, more than 37,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israel's assault on the territory. The Ministry of Health is Hamas, and nowhere in there did CNN say Hamas has not provided any evidence ever to back up those figures. Of course not. Have you ever seen that in a headline? So much of the media has been doing things like this for months now. One is the Washington Post. I heard about this from a listener. She shared with me an analysis from the National Review, which is a conservative publication. They point to a lot of obvious journalistic failures by the Washington Post. And this does not surprise me. I actually contacted the Washington Post myself just a few weeks after the October 7th massacres to point out to them the kind of thing that they were doing. They were reporting all of these Hamas claims as though they were legitimate. They were also citing Save the Children on alleged numbers of children killed in Gaza, but they were not explaining that Save the Children was going by Hamas. It's amazing how bad the media has been. The National Review pointed out that the Post ran some bombshell front page story about Israel allegedly separating Palestinian mothers from their premature children and did not even seek comment from Israeli officials. That's Journalism 101. Every high school reporter knows better than this. When you're reporting on an alleged policy or action by a government, you ask the government and they didn't even ask. And then after the piece ran, it turned out actually, no, the Post had it wrong. That was not what was happening. The story was an absolute mess. For a story to hit the front page, it has to go through so many people, lots of editors. And somehow no one noticed that they hadn't even looked into this, hadn't even sought a comment. The Post ended up adding an editor's note saying that this story, quote, fell short of the Post's standards for fairness. But by that point, the damage was done on the front page. And here's something important that the National Review pointed out that brings this full circle. Numerous people at the Post who have been leading coverage of the war are alums of Al Jazeera. The paper's Middle East editor spent more than a decade at Al Jazeera. That's what his bio says. And of course, that bio, which is on the Washington Post website, does not mention that Al Jazeera is state-owned Qatari news. Meanwhile, the Washington Post has covered the importance of labeling state news as state news. Here's a piece from their coverage of a story I discussed last week, a battle involving Twitter labeling state news. Twitter has removed labels designating global media accounts as government-controlled or funded, allowing propaganda from China, Russia, and other countries to be more widely seen and believed. And here's a piece they did about TikTok. New research shows that Russian state media are posting English and Spanish videos to TikTok and have doubled last year's engagement on their posts, which include attacks on President Biden's Israel policy and his age, as well as promotion of far-right commentator Tucker Carlson's Russia coverage. But when it comes to Al Jazeera, the post itself keeps ignoring and hiding the fact that it is state-owned. Okay, 
I think that's probably enough hypocrisy to expose you to today. I don't want to depress you. Life is filled with awesomeness and beauty, too. Coming up, something much lighter. An update on a viral story about a viral story. Right after this. Hey, Josh. This is Christian Posh from Alexandria, Virginia. Just wanting to let you know that I really enjoyed listening to your podcast. And and more than that, I've really enjoyed and and been thankful for your fact-driven and and data-centric approach to conversations. You know, whether it's in the paid leave, shared parenting, or or fatherhood space, or in the general arena of holding folks accountable, conversations like the ones you are having and leading are critical, especially during these times. Thanks for what you do. In episode 10, I answered a bunch of listener questions and shared their comments. One of the comments I shared was about a viral story involving a man in the Detroit area who had suddenly found himself in the news. He had a court hearing about his license having been suspended, and he took part in that hearing via video while driving, which of course sounded hilarious, so lots of media jumped on it and didn't even bother to check. Then a local station in Detroit took a few minutes to actually look it up and found that the suspension had been lifted a couple of years earlier. So then that story took off about how the media had gotten it wrong. But then the story got even weirder. Now, news agencies have reported that he never had a license in the first place. So in that case, he should not have been driving. You might wonder, how do you suspend a license that doesn't exist? Well, that is sadly not shocking in any bureaucracy. But the big picture lesson remains the same, that media should take time to get their facts and figure out what's going on instead of jumping on something viral. Imagine if a news organization decided to only report what's concrete and factual and researched. That would be a sea change in our media ecosystem. And that's it for today. But I have some thank yous, obviously, to all of you who are supporting this show. If you can become a paid subscriber at the newsletter, that will allow this show to keep existing. And I'm currently compiling lists to start thanking you by name, if you wish, on the show. The super low rate to support at only three bucks a month has been extended, so you have a little longer to jump in at that rate. Also, thank you to other media that have had me on lately to talk about all this. Thank you to Martha Zoller and her show. And as many of you know, I do lots of columns and op-eds for big news sites around the country, even in other countries. But I actually had not done one yet for my local paper, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I live in Atlanta. So I just did one for them for Father's Day. I spoke about my reality check on a study surrounding dad's health, which I talked about in episode 10. You can uh, see that column in the newsletter, too. The first presidential debate is scheduled for June 27th. That's right after this episode comes out. So be sure to listen to my episode about presidential debates and why they are a disaster for truth. I'll jump into the newsletter to discuss that with paid subscribers after the debate. So join that conversation if you can. As always, thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you next week. A shout out to Nextiva. Here are three things all businesses need to do. Lower operating costs, reduce customer churn and turnover, and boost sales. Nextiva helps businesses of all sizes do that with its AI-powered customer experience platform. Reduce expenses, find and remove causes of customer friction, maximize closing rates. Nextiva helps you do all this and more.